All right. Well, we will go ahead and get started. So uh, my name is Aaron Standard, and I'm one of the creators of Aka.net. I'm also the founder and CEO of a company called Petabridge. Uh, we help businesses in lots of different industries all over the world build uh, mission-critical real-time applications on top of it. And the subject of my talk today is death to latency. Now, what this is really about is being able to build soft real-time applications. These are applications that are a relatively new class of app that's basically been enabled through recent technological developments. So a really good example of that is the introduction of web sockets to browsers 10 years ago. This allows us to go ahead and push events out to the client rather than have to have them pull for it. And this is what makes all sorts of interactive uh, web applications like collaborative editing, chat, et cetera, all possible directly through a browser. And there's also been other improvements in areas like, uh, for instance, manufacturing, where there's a lot more devices that are inexpensive that can be embedded to help automate the construction process, or can be used to go ahead and use systems like computer vision to go ahead and automate jobs that would normally require a number of people to do. So these applications are, do not follow your sort of traditional paradigms or your traditional rules. What distinguishes a real-time application from everything else is that these applications come with what we call soft real-time processing guarantees. This means that data is basically highly perishable inside these systems. Now, before I get too deep into what a soft real-time application is, we should talk about what it isn't. And these are hard real-time applications. A good example of one of those is the brake control system on your car. These applications are built with entirely different operating systems, real-time OSs like VxWorks, and they have conditions like if this application doesn't execute this function in under 50 milliseconds, it's a fatal crash. And these are used basically to do embedded systems development primarily. That is not what we're talking about today. We're talking about cloud-hosted applications or things that might be hosted on-premise in a data center, but generally speaking, internet-connected applications that have a soft processing guarantee. This means that the operating system doesn't fail if our request takes longer than 100 milliseconds, but it might mean our users get pissed off. That's, what the, that's the distinction there. So a soft real-time processing guarantee means that the longer something takes, the less useful it is. That's the gist of it. So data becomes stale really quickly. An example we can all relate to is if we've ever used, let's say, a video calling application or really any sort of conferencing app, you can tolerate a small amount of latency, let's say 50 to 100 milliseconds, and that's not going to really affect the quality of the call. But what happens if it starts taking one second or two seconds or five seconds for something you say to be heard by the receiver on the other end? very quickly the application becomes useless and customers will move on and either use a totally different product or they might resort to leaving a voicemail rather than doing a live video call. So that's what these classes of applications are all about, is being able to facilitate real-time interactivity typically between people or between devices. So that's really what we're looking at. Now, the other thing that's interesting about some of these applications is it might not just be merely inconveniencing a user. That might be the consequence of failing to observe that latency guarantee. It can actually mean losing money, or it could mean a safety issue. A uh, good example, a lot of the industrial IoT applications I've worked on have emergency shutoff procedures where if some sensor detects that temperature's too high or maybe a machine's moving too fast, it has to be able to power everything down quickly in order to make sure that equipment's not damaged and people aren't hurt. So there are some real consequences aside from just having a laggy phone call when it comes to building these types of apps. So some examples of applications that are very similar and are in the same domain where one is real time and one is not. Voice chat is real time. It's all about being able to actually have a conversation in real time with somebody who's not in the same room as you. Compare that to, let's say, voicemail, where I'm leaving a recording for someone else to pick up at their leisure. These applications have very similar requirements. They're in the same space. But the difference is that the real-time use case is more valuable for getting instant turnaround time and shortening the business cycle, whereas voicemail is something you do only if you can't get a hold of that person. 
Ditto for chat versus email. And ditto for something like a live auction platform like eBay versus an e-commerce website like Amazon. On eBay, um, the auctions are taking place in real time. There's a finite date where the auction ends. And if you're one of the bidders, you want to be notified when your bid is beaten so you can possibly make another one in order to stay on top of it. Whereas if you're just buying a package of socks off Amazon, there's nothing really that exciting or interactive about it, right? So these are sort of the, di and then yeah, I used another example here of collaboration. Having multiple people working together on a Google document versus people checking out a doc on SharePoint, editing it, then checking it back in over a long cycle. Very similar looking workflows, but one's a real-time business case, the other's not. There are an increasingly large number of domains that are moving into real-time application development. And it's because it's valuable for end users and it's valuable for the business. So this is all business driven, all this stuff. It's not driven because someone wants to add WebSocket development to their resume. At least, I hope not. So some of the example domains we've worked in are on here, sports betting, dynamic pricing. A lot of this stuff might sound like sort of exciting or far-fetched in case you're working in industries that are a little bit more traditional. But even traditional, and in case I offend anyone in this industry, boring domains like insurance actually have a need for real-time processing. Good example, if you sell auto or home insurance, you might need to be able to generate a real-time quote for a user while they're on your website so you can get them into your user acquisition pipeline. That's actually a type of dynamic pricing activity. So even in industries that are as old and, again, kind of boring like insurance have a business need for this. So if you're going down the road of building a real-time application, you've been given some directives by your stakeholders, you know sort of that you need to be able to complete certain types of operations within a finite window of time. The first key business question is, okay, how big should that window of time be? Uh, so a good example, if I'm building a algorithmic trading application, my latency window might be able to be measured in single milliseconds, so somewhere between two and five. That's a very short time window. That's like high frequency trading or foreign currency exchange, that type of thing. Uh, if I'm doing something like multiplayer video games, maybe it'll be in the hundreds of milliseconds, might be my latency range. And if I'm doing something like computing an insurance quote, maybe I'll have as long as 30 seconds, uh, since I can, uh, if I can let the user sit there and wait for a minute while we think, right? It's gonna vary by industry, how big your time constraint is, but this is something you have to choose early. It's a key business requirement. And so then the first engineering question becomes, given that I need to complete this operation in this number of milliseconds, how can I guarantee I can do that every time for every request? How do I model an operation so I can reliably complete it under that time frame? So that's the first business question. The second business question deals with the basic issue of concurrency. So how do I make sure that a single instance of my application can service an arbitrarily large number of concurrent requests of the same type all underneath that latency window? Because now you have to start thinking about things like shared resources and bottlenecks forming inside the application. So how do I build a system that can allow me to minimize the impact of that and reliably execute all these requests in parallel underneath that time threshold? So that's the second business question. The third business question is how do I operationalize all of this? How do I deploy it to a cloud environment? How do I make sure I can scale up and down with demand? And how can I deal with other real world issues like failures or data consistency or deployments? How can I make sure I can honor that guarantee without taking my system offline in order to do that? So Akka.net is gonna help us do all of this. So it's gonna be kind of the foundational tier for helping build some of this out. So keep that in mind as we go through the next section here. Now, why do we need to have this presentation at all? Why can't people just run out and start building real-time applications right away with tools they've been using for the past you know, 10, 20, 30 years? And the reason is, is that those old paradigms don't work. And the old paradigm I'm really referring to is database-driven development. When I was first starting to do uh, work on real-time applications about 10 years ago. I also started with the philosophy of just let the database handle it. And for reasons I'm about to get into, it never works. So today, when people bring that up, this is usually how I reply. 
Now, here is an example of where the database is going to struggle to help us build a real-time application. Let's say we're doing clickstream analytics, where a user is going to produce four discrete events by doing something on our website, or something in our mobile application, or maybe they're doing stuff um, by filling out various forms or whatever throughout our application. We care that this user has completed a specific set of four discrete events. And we have a requirement that once the fourth and final event has been observed, we have to fire a notification at that user. That notification could be a targeted ad or marketing offer. It might be a security alert. Depends quite a bit on what your business case is. But the key is that we have to let the user know quickly, otherwise the notification won't be very effective. If they get a security alert, hours after their account was compromised, that's pretty worthless. And in the event that we don't have the, all these sufficient events, we have to go ahead and continue to wait, continue to try to observe if those events get produced. We're essentially building a little state machine is what we're creating here. Now, the original way I tried to build a system just like this 10 years ago was doing the database-driven development approach, which is called read after write where I have my stateless web application, I have my highly consistent database, and each time a user would produce an event, that would get set back to our web API, and we would go ahead and insert a row uh, belonging to that user in a table somewhere, and we would then read all the rows back of all the events we've observed for that user, and would try to see are all four events present inside the database. And in theory, this is how this should work. When the fourth and final event is observed, uh, the, cl the uh, client that's handling it inside the web API will go ahead and fire a notification and the job will be done. And this was the theoretical model I had when I first built this system you know, about 10 years ago. The reality was a little different. Namely that there was no guarantee that any of the clients would be able to reason about the user's data in the same way. And as a result, we had a 99% miss rate on actually firing events, meaning this thing only worked 1% of the time when we did it. And the reason for that is simple. It's that the, even if you have a strongly consistent database, it does nothing to help you with the concurrency layer of your actual application itself. It has no way of essentially coalescing all the activity within one process that owns the, uh, has the responsibility of replying back to that end user. In a system like Akka.net, this would be very trivial to solve this problem. So that's kind of the first issue there, is that there was no ability to reason about what was happening at the application layer. There was no guarantee that I would get all four events back. So the typical way you would have to fix a system like this, if you're doing database-driven development, is introduce polling. You'd have to have a cron job that goes and scans recently inserted users, maybe at a rate of once per second, maybe every few seconds, and at that point, you're no longer a real-time system. You're now a schedule-driven system, basically a batch processor at that point. So the reasons why old paradigms fail are fairly straightforward. Probably the most obvious reason is database-driven development is very expensive from an I.O. standpoint. It requires lots of round-trip network I.O., lots of serialization, Query planning, possibly, depending on, if, depending on which database you use and how complicated your queries are, and possibly disk I.O. This is going to create a high floor for latency inside your system. It's going to go ahead and, let's say if you have to get an operation done in under five milliseconds, that will not be theoretically possible in a system designed this way. Now, if you have 30 seconds to work with, you'll probably be fine. But in really low latency scenarios, it will no longer be achievable. So that's one reason. The second reason is what we just showed in the previous slides, which is no application layer concurrency control. You don't have any ability to synchronize the clients through the database. That's not really feasible, even with something like SQL Server underneath. But the biggest issue that these systems have is that they are fundamentally centralized. All of the state and all of the, essentially all of the source of truth of your system all converges in one location inside your network. And this creates side effects once you start scaling up in terms of the number of users you have to support and the number of requests you have to process. And that leads to an inescapable bottleneck and even worse, a single point of failure possibly. 
So if we'd had, let's say, our, our sort of third question, which is about operationalizing a real-time application, how can I make sure that when we're hitting peak demand, everyone's requests are still processed on time? Well, when that happens, the pressure that's going to build up in this system is all going to converge where all the arrows are going, right around our SQL Server primary and secondary replicas. And this system will start to slow down as a result of lock contention, as a result of the connection pool beginning to, beginning to max out. And on top of that, the system's just going to be perpetually busy processing all these requests. So centralization is something that will fundamentally limit your ability to be real time depending on how large your application is. Um, a small application that's running, let's say, on-premise in a factory somewhere where you don't have to worry about variable demand may not have this issue. But if you're building a cloud-facing system where you have customers, such as if you're doing, let's say, software as a service, or maybe you're doing uh, dynamic pricing for uh, e-commerce customers, you're going to run into this problem with this design. So the solution, ultimately, to trying to build low-latency architectures from the bottom up resides around changing the way we think about who owns the truth in our system. Where does the source of truth live? So that's the first thing we need to, we need to shift in order to make sure we can control latency and reduce the, let's say, the, the floor that's on there, get it as low as possible. And the reason for this is pretty simple. If you to consider these two architectures, you have your database-driven architecture on the left and a stateful architecture on the right, where the data and the work are co-located inside the same process, that architecture on the right will be orders of magnitude faster than the one on the left. And it's simple. The reason why we're able to achieve much lower latencies in that design on the right is because we're leveraging a principle known as state locality, meaning that work and data are co-located together in the same process. So rather than making queries over the network and serializing uh, result sets and doing all the things we'd typically do in a database-driven application, we're able to just check an adjacent register in memory on the machine we're on and produce a result immediately. So cutting out all of that I.O. gives us a good starting point for keeping latency low inside of our system. It also is going to eliminate polling as a, as a potential, uh, potential device we need to rely on. Instead, because we can observe all of these state changes for a given business entity inside our system, let's say, um, I use that example of generating auto insurance quotes. Let's say an entity is one user who is looking for auto insurance. I can view all of the events, and those events might be users submitting pieces of data we need, such as their driver's license number and the type of car they drive and that type of stuff. I can observe those events arriving for that entity and immediately react and process the risk model we're going to use to price their quote. And then I can actually send them a notification when that's done, and that can be used to update their display and to send them an email. And essentially, we can make this whole system reactive rather than driven around guesswork and polling, which is what database-driven development leads us to. The other benefit of this approach is that you can co-locate many different domain objects that are interrelated into the same process and have them interact with each other. When you're building an industrial IoT system, for instance, if you're doing, let's say, manufacturing, or maybe you're doing uh, automated shipping and packaging, uh, you can go ahead and have a, a series of sensors, such as uh, cameras, or maybe, um, maybe being able to go ahead and use laser sensors, uh, working together with mechanical parts that move in the factory, such as a picker or a conveyor belt. And you can go ahead and use them to signal, okay, based on this sensor reading, I need to tell the conveyor belt to move this far ahead so this picker can come in and grab this object and load it onto a pallet afterwards. So state locality is kind of the first building block of being able to keep latency under control. And that's really going to be the answer to the first question. How do I guarantee that my operation can complete in under n milliseconds? The answer is the application is going to start functioning as the source of truth. And it's going to be because we're stateful that we're able to bound latency for each operation. So one important reason why I have this slide up here is a natural question you'll ask at this point is, OK, well, if the application state is the source of truth, how do we deal with issues like deployments and crashes and scaling out and scaling back down again, all these sort of real world concerns, right? 
So the answer is that the database isn't completely out of the picture here. We've just changed its role slightly is what we've done. The database now acts as essentially cold storage for our data. So every time we go and update one of our business objects, we might write a delta down to the database using event sourcing, or maybe we'll take a snapshot of our state and save it down there. That way, in the event that we need to move processing for a given uh, business entity in our system to another process because maybe one shut down, maybe it crashed, maybe there was something that was unhealthy about it, we need the ability to recover that data and pick up where we left off. So the database's role is to help guarantee that our processing can be done in a re-entrant fashion. So rather than querying the database on all of our read operations, we mostly use it to recover the very first time an entity starts. And then from that point on, we're, we're mostly writing to it. We're writing each time a critical event happens in our system so we can reflect that the next time we have to rehydrate that state again. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, good. So this is how we've answered our first question so far, which is, okay, how do I bound latency? And the answer is we need a stateful programming approach. Now, in terms of how do we actually implement that programming approach, this is going to be where Aka.net and actors enter the picture. And that's also going to help us address question two, which is how do I allow an arbitrarily large number of concurrent instances of my operation all complete successfully within this deadline? So this is where the actor model is going to enter the picture here. Uh, this is Fabio, and I, I abuse his likeness in like, all of my presentations. So what is an actor exactly? Uh, this is a basic Akadana actor on screen. I'm going to show a more complicated one when we get to our demo in a little bit. But this actor is just a C-sharp class. We also support F-sharp. I know there's been like 1,000 F-sharp talks here, so I want to make sure you, uh, those developers know that they're, they're supported. But this is a C-sharp uh, example, and we're inheriting from the receive actor base type in Akka.net. And what a receive actor does is allows us to define some strongly typed receive statements. The way you work with state in the actor model is each entity is modeled as a unique actor, a unique actor instance, basically. So I have a ping actor is my type here. Uh, in my other demo, it's called a product totals actor, and it's doing accounting for product inventory inside our system. And that actor has certain messages it can process, and it has internal properties and fields that make up its state. So state in Akka.net is not some fancy thing that requires you to inherit from a custom base class or whatever. It's arbitrary .NET types that you, that you basically initialize as properties and fields of your actor class. So it's pretty straightforward. Now, what's special about the actor model is the guarantees it makes around how actors behave. Actors are serial processors, meaning they only process one message at a time. Under the covers, when you start an actor in Akka.net, every actor gets its own queue that basically belongs only to that actor. So you can think of it as, if I have a process with a million actors in it, I have a million very tiny cues that all these act that e each one belonging to its own actor. That actor will process those messages one at a time. And because we're processing messages one at a time, we are able to guarantee that all of the actor's internal state is automatically thread safe. There's no need for synchronization mechanisms, no need for locks, none of that stuff. Basically, anytime an actor is processing a message, that message processing operation is the only thing the actor's doing, and any operations you perform inside that actor are going to be synchronized automatically. It's the actor's queue is what basically synchronizes the actor. And the actor's going to process those messages just like it would any other queue, in first in, first out order. So the oldest message is first. It's going to work backwards from that. Finally, down here, you'll see the sender field. When you send a message to an actor, I get a reference to the actor who sent me that message. Now, if something that was not an actor sent me this message, such as uh, an ASP.NET controller or a gRPC service, that sender property is going to essentially report to dev null. It's going to not do anything if I reply back to it. But I don't necessarily need to know that. I can go ahead and try replying back to it. Aka.NET might log what's called a dead letter, indicating that this message was non-deliverable. And that probably means your developer uh, needs to look at your logs and debug it. But this is what a basic actor is, fundamentally. 
And the way we create actors is we instantiate what's called an actor system. An actor system is a long-lived object. It's going to live as long as your .NET process is. So basically, you don't start actor systems every time you need an operation. Typically, you start it once when you're booting up your application, and then you hang on to it afterwards. Uh, the way Akka.net is typically used in practice is usually it's an I-hosted service that boots the actor system behind the scenes and then registers it into the DI container. It's typically what we do. Um, once you have your actor system, you can begin creating actors. And the way we do that is we define uh, what's called props for an actor. This is going to specify the actor's type, its constructor arguments, and there's a couple of other optional properties we can configure on this actor, such as uh, if you wanted to change the type of queue this actor uses. Maybe you want to have a priority queue that prioritizes certain messages ahead of others. You can specify that on this props class here. We feed that props class into the actor of method, and we can optionally give this actor a name, and that name will show up in the actor's uh, unique URL. Every single actor has a globally unique address in Akka.net, so you can go ahead and send a message to an actor's address somewhere if you don't have a reference to it. So it's basically being able to look up an actor based on its URI. Uh, when you pass the props into the actor of method, that's going to start the actor, and you'll get a reference back to it. And that actor reference is what you can use to actually begin sending messages to the actor under the covers. And actor references are serializable. You can go ahead and transmit them over the network and send them back and forth if you want. So this is kind of the basis, basics of creating an actor. Now, where actors are useful in terms of building low latency applications? Actors you can think of as stateful cloud objects where if we step away from the infrastructure of Akka.net for a second and think about our business domain, we might be thinking about objects like users or devices or insurance quotes or maybe an order that needs to be fulfilled. These are all the different types of entities that might appear in the businesses that you work on. Typically in Akka.net and in really in any actor model implementation, you, think you would go ahead and model each one of those entities as its own unique actor instance. So if I have a million users, I'm going to have a million user actors floating around inside my system. And those actors will be instantiated the first time the user sends a request. And if you're using Akadot cluster sharding, which we're going to talk about a bit later, those actors will be automatically turned back off after a couple of minutes. And they'll be reinstantiated again if you need to send a message to it down the road. So those actors can kind of appear and disappear from existence as you need them. We do this in order to make sure you don't run out of memory, is what we're doing there. Now, the way actors work is they process messages that are sent to it either by other actors or by other components in your .NET application. And as these events arrive, the actor is going to process them and use it to change its state, possibly. So if we have that clickstream example from earlier, where we're looking for those four events in order to send that user a notification, I might observe those events arrive in my message handlers, and I can check after I process each event, is my state ready for this notification? And once that Boolean property is true, which is going to happen concurrent, uh, at the very last instant of me processing the fourth message, I can fire off a notification. And that notification can be me sending a message to another actor. It could be this actor invoking a web service. It could be this actor sending a gRPC message. It could be writing to a signal or hub if you want to. Sky's the limit. Anything you can do in C Sharp or F Sharp, this actor can do. So the power of this programming model is that it allows us to create one class that represents how this entity should behave. And then we can run thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of instances of it. It's pretty common for actors to live, for there to be as many as several million actors in a process. Uh, and the reason why is actors are actually pretty inexpensive resources. They don't use any CPU, well, they don't have a message to process, and the amount of memory they use is typically pretty low. Um, really depends mostly on your state that you implement. Now, Actors accumulate state in memory. This is where we get back to our first processing guarantee. It's the actor's internal properties and fields are our source of truth and are, are, are basically our state for our application. And we can observe as we're processing messages how that state might be changing. And we can decide, all right, this is the fourth event. I need to send this user a security alert. I'm going to go ahead 
and change my behavior to a clo- from an open state to a closed state. And when I do that, I'm going to fire a notification via a push notification service to this user and maybe also via email too. And we have the ability to do that without any database infrastructure, without any I.O., or really, let's say, any, any third-party dependencies. All you really need to do this is just the Akka library itself. So this gives us a very low-latency, lightweight way of beginning to build real-time applications. And like I mentioned earlier, actors are cheap. So this gets us to our second question. How do I observe this processing guarantee within a single process for many concurrent requests? And the answer is that each entity should get its own actor, and all of these entities can run in parallel with each other, or can run concurrently, depending on how technical you want to be. So for instance, if I have a big fire hose of IoT data coming from a range of devices I'm connected to, I need to be able to uphold real-time processing guarantees for all of them. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use one of the properties of Akka.net, which is the actor hierarchy. Actors can be organized in parent-child relationships. So I might have an aggregate here, this device of type A actor. This actor owns, let's say, all of the temperature sensors in our warehouse. So if I get temperature sensor data for, from, let's say, a thousand different sensors, I might have a thousand children, each one correlating to an individual sensor. And so all of those a thousand sensor actors can process their events in parallel. And Akadana actors are very fast. A single actor on my five-year-old desktop at home can process about six million messages a second. If I scale this up to a very large actor hierarchy where there's lots of actors running continuously, I can do on the newest version of Akka.net running on .NET 6 about 80 to 90 million messages per second across hundreds or thousands of actors. So that's probably more throughput than most of you will ever need. But the reason why that's important is each one of those operations is very low latency out of the gate. Actors get scheduled very quickly and are able to clear out their mailbox very fast. And we have a fair scheduling system that makes sure that uh, actor, all actors get serviced relatively quickly. Now, if I have a second type of entity in my system, let's say I had temperature sensors before, maybe I have a volumetric sensor as well. That sen that all those events that belong to that sensor type will go to a totally different group of actors, possibly in the same process, and those can also run in parallel with our temperature sensors as well. This is where we observe that second guarantee. It's the fact that you can have lots of actors all getting scheduled to run independently of each other. And that way, all of those objects are updating their state, figuring out if they need to fire notifications all independently from each other. And this gives programmers a relatively simple abstraction that's easy to manage. That's the most important facet of this, is that it helps reduce the complexity of what the programmers need to do to build a stateful app. All right, so we've answered the first two key business questions. Namely, how do we guarantee that one operation can complete under a soft real-time processing deadline? And how can we make sure that an arbitrarily large number of parallel requests can be serviced by one process under that deadline as well? But now we need to address the, the, key, the real money-making question, which is, how do I observe this guarantee for peak demand on our system and deal with all the other real-world stuff that can come up, such as the fallibility of the network? or doing deployments? And how do I make sure I do all of this without compromising the data consistency of my application and without introducing downtime? Right? This, is where, this is where I spend most of my time talking with customers, is this question number three. So Akka.net's a big framework. It has lots of different packages. Of the core actor libraries, these are the three that we're going to focus on for answering question number three. The first is Akka.cluster which allows us to build a high availability network of lots of actor systems all uh, coordinating with each other to distribute work and state in a essentially a, a location transparent manner. The second tool is Akadot cluster sharding. This allows us to distribute entities in an even fashion over the network and allows us to guarantee there is at most one copy of each entity in our system. So a quick trivia question for those of you who are attending today. If I was keeping track of a user's shopping cart in my Akadana application, 
And because of a programming error, I ended up having one process that had one version of the user shopping cart and another process that had a different version of that user shopping cart. What sort of problems would that cause for my business? It would cause some pretty massive data consistency problems, where essentially uh, I would probably lose money, is the answer. So the key there is you need to make sure there is at most one copy of your entity's state somewhere inside the system. You don't want to have a split brain, in other words, where you have multiple actors that all think they own the same entity. This is what cluster sharding does for us. It also manages the life cycle of those actors for us. Normally, by default, Naka.net, when you call actor of, that actor is never going to shut down until you tell it to. In cluster sharding, it'll automatically terminate actors that haven't processed a message uh, within two minutes. That way, you can free up memory and not have to worry about new actors starting up and your memory pool shrinking all the time. Finally, we're going to talk about Aka.Persistence. Aka.Persistence is a database agnostic way of making actor state reentrant and durable. So being able to go and journal events to a database, being able to recover them when the actor gets started back up again. All three of these components work in concert to help build highly available systems that are reasonably consistent and partition tolerant as well. So the way to think about Aka.Cluster cluster is what it's really going to give us is a very useful property known as topology awareness. Now, when you're building a stateless web application, you typically do not need all of the web servers to know about each other. They don't care. They're dumb applications that only talk to the database typically, right? So there's no need for web applications to work together on a network of any kind. In a stateful application, that's not the case. Because your application is the source of truth, and you want to make sure all state for any given business entity is concentrated and owned by one actor, you need to know who is capable of hosting actors and where are they right now. That's what Aka.Cluster Cluster gives us the ability to do. Essentially, we're building a peer-to-peer -peer network, is what Aka.Cluster Cluster does. And I'll show some code in just a second here, uh, because I know this is a lot of concepts that I'm throwing at you all at once. But basically, each one of these uh, sort of big teal circles here is an actor system that has a tree of actors running inside of it. And typically, what the cluster is going to be useful for is allowing us to determine where data and work should be sent inside the network. If I have an actor that owns my clickstream data, I want all the click events that I produce moving around through my, through my customer's website, I want to make sure all of my click events end up at my actor, wherever it is in the cluster. Even though it might be process A might receive that request from the web balancer, but process E might be where that actor is. Aka.Cluster cluster allows me to figure that out and send the message to the right place at the right time. What Aka.Cluster cluster also does is lets me know about those real world failure conditions we talked about. When a process crashes or when a process gets so overloaded that it can't respond quickly, or if a new process joins the network, if we're using something like auto-scaling, Aka.Cluster cluster will, will give me notifications about that. And components like Aka.Cluster cluster sharding and clustered routers, these are different distribution tools we're going to learn about. Those can react to those events and begin sending data and sending work to those new locations on the network. Conversely, if we're scaling down, we can also use that information to move data that's on a node that's leaving the network onto nodes that aren't. So that's the gist of Aka.Cluster cluster and what its purpose is. And the way it gets used is typically it's a distribution tool. It's designed to allow us to build a distributed system, a network of different uh, processes that are all cooperating together to try to build a real-time application. So in this case, I'm using what's called a clustered router, which is a, just a type of actor you can create. And this router has a, a strategy you can configure for how it distributes messages. Typically, it's almost always going to be like a round robin router, which is basically a load balancer. So this router on node one might start receiving messages that are coming in uh, via a HTTP API that's also exposed on this node. And we'll start using that to route traffic to actors that live on nodes two, three, and four. And this is all done transparently. I, as the end user, don't need to know that those actors exist on the network. And this is where I'm going to go ahead and take a step into a demo for a second and stop dropping new concepts on you for a moment. 
since it's quite a lot. Let's see. How do I make this a little bigger? Tool windows. Hmm. Well, I don't know how to do it in Rider, but I know how to do it in Windows. There we go. Okay. This is an example. I guess it would have been better if I blew it up in Rider. This is an example of what starting Akka.net and a modern, let's say, .NET 6 application looks like. This is a minimal web API, or yeah, minimal web API. And we have a package called Akka.hosting that just binds into all the iHosting extensions that you, you normally would use every day. So we're going to go ahead and create an actor system called SQL sharding. Uh, we're going to turn on Akka.remote, which is what Akka.cluster uses to communicate across processes. It's basically just a TCP connection, is what that is. Uh, we're going to turn clustering on. And then we're going to create, in fact, let me move to this process. Here we go. We're going to create a shard region. Um, that is going to be a set of entity actors that are managed for us automatically by Akka.net. And what the shard region is called is products. That's the type of entity we're using. And if I scroll over, get rid of that. Yeah, let me get rid of that real fast. Basically, what we're going to do is for each unique entity inside our system, we're going to create a brand new product totals actor that owns the entity state. And the way we determine which entity is which is using this uh, product message router. It's going to inspect the messages that we're sending to the shard region. And if that message implements this interface, we're going to say the product ID that's exposed on this interface here is going to be the unique identity of that entity. So essentially, we're using the properties of the messages that are being sent to our system to determine where those messages should go and which actor owns them. Make sense to everybody? Yeah. So that's what's going on here. And then I have my product totals actor. This is the entity actor that cluster sharding is actually creating. This actor only takes in its constructor the entity ID that we extracted from one of those messages. So that's the only real thing we pass into its constructor. And from there, we will go ahead and allocate a product state. This is basically just a C sharp record that has all my doodads on it. So I have some purchasing totals and a couple of orders and inventory warnings and all that stuff. That's all just part of my domain. This actor uses Akada persistence to recover its state each time it's created. So I recover my state by replaying, <coughs> excuse me, I recover my state by replaying the first snapshot that I saved in Akada persistence. So I might save a full point in time copy of my state and I recover that as soon as my actor starts. And then after that, I might recover any of these product events that I had previously saved. So this actor goes and performs a full recovery before it processes any other messages that are sent to it. And then that's what I do here <coughs> in this little command handler. These are the live messages I'm processing while my application's running. And these are all going to be generated via my web UI, which I'll pull up. Let me get rid of that. So this is my little web UI right here. Now, I am not ever going to be giving any talks on UI development, so I apologize if it looks a little basic. Uh, we all have our different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, user interfaces is definitely not one of mine. But if I click into here, this Eagle Rare 10-year-old uh, 750 milliliter, uh, this, is this is American whiskey, um, <clears throat> I have a price, a amount of available units, uh, product total, and some revenue. I can go ahead and order, let's say, 100 bottles. And I'll see that appear on my supply log down here as one of the events that this actor processed. When I just did that web request just now, I'll receive an iProduct command. And this iProduct command, if I take a look on it, if I go to my implementation, will probably be a purchase product command in this case, which will say, here's the product I want, here's the quantity, and I'll go and convert that into an event that I'll append to my state object from there. And this is a concrete example of, let's say, one stateful entity doing its processing, where I have a set of commands that are going to enforce a state change. 
I also have a set of queries. So if I actually dig in here real quick. I have a set of queries, commands, and events. Let me do this real quick again. There we go. So I have some product commands, which are inputs, product events, which are outputs, and those are what get persisted to our database, and those also get recovered when the actor starts again. And then I have some queries, which are basically a way of fetching my actor state without actually changing it. And that's what we're using to actually power the web UI that you're seeing, is we're querying this actor each time and getting its data. So for instance, if I go to my product page, here, and I go to the code behind. Here we go. What I'm doing here is I'm grabbing a hold of the actor registry. This is kind of part of Akka.net's hosting system. And I'm saying I want to get an actor um, that is registered with type product. And I'm going to perform an ask operation. Well, I'm going to say fetch this product ID. And I'm going to return this uh, fetch result. And I'm going to set my razor pages state equal to that fetch result state. And that's what's going to be used to populate all those items on screen here. So this is kind of a very simple end-to-end -end example of what programming with actors actually looks like. This application itself is not real time. But I wanted to include something in here that helped make these concepts more concrete before I keep going. So this sample is all open source, by the way. Uh, if I go ahead and zoom back out. Okay, let me get rid of that real quick. I'll pull this back up. So that sample is all open source, and I just went through a number of things there. Now, <coughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about Akadot Persistence. Akadot Persistence fundamentally works <coughs> via event sourcing, where these APIs, that command and recover API, plus if I go back to my code sample, and I go to my product actor, this persist all method, or there's also just a single persist. These are what allow me to write events to my backend. In this case, I'm using SQL Server as my backend. We have <coughs> support for at least a dozen different database types. I've personally worked on all of these ones, and customers have implemented ones for things like Google Big Table, for instance, or, or DynamoDB or Cosmos. So, Akadot Persistence gives my actors a database agnostic way of journaling their state using event sourcing and then recovering it the next time they start. And this makes it very feasible for me to go ahead and have my actors recover their state during a crash or when we're scaling out to another process or in the event that I brought my application offline had to bring it back up again. It allows my actors to pick up where they left off. That's the one role a database really needs to, needs to play in a stateful system, is you need to have some way of making sure that state's durable. So you still need a database for that. You just don't want to make it the center of everything that you're up to. And the way this fundamentally works is our persistent actors still retain state. Uh, like you saw earlier, I had my product state object in that actor. That state gets modified as a result of the messages that we process. And whenever someone else interacts with us, we're using our state to do that. But we're also asynchronously, or possibly synchronously, depending on which API in Rocket.Persistence Persistence you use, we're also journaling the changes to our state and sometimes taking snapshots of it in order to make sure that we can always pick up when we left off again, right? And here's the, what the recovery process essentially looks like as well. We're going to replay the messages in the original order they were persisted and run them back through our model. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to sell you on the, event on the benefits of event sourcing, uh, but it's a very powerful model that works very well with actors, generally speaking. You don't have to use it in order to build stateful applications, but it's probably the simplest out-of-the-box way to do it, is using Akka Persistence. Now, the last thing I want to focus in on for a second is Akadot Cluster Sharding. Akadot Cluster Sharding's role is mostly there to provide data consistency and to make sure that your work is distributed evenly throughout your cluster, which is something you need to do in order to guarantee those low latencies. You don't want to have what are called hotspots forming in your cluster, which means that some nodes are doing disproportionately more work than others. It's typically a programming error is what causes hotspots to form. A uh, good example, a lot of customers in the United States uh, will shard their data based on the state the user's in, because you want to have a low cardinality key that repeats often, right? 
Well, unfortunately, the states are very lopsided in terms of population in the U.S. So if you get California, Texas, and New York on the same node, you're processing about 40% of the population right there. Meanwhile, if you get Wyoming and New Hampshire, uh, you're processing less than 1%. So a much better sharding key would be to use something like a zip code instead. Now, <clears throat> Aqueduct cluster sharding automatically instantiates and passivates entity actors in the cluster. It guarantees, even during network partitions, that there will be at most one unique instance of all your entities. And all messages for the same entity all get routed to the same place. We have to do this in order to guarantee consistency. Aqueduct cluster sharding is also very smart about when it's rebalancing. If one location on the network is being taken offline because we're scaling down or maybe we're doing a deployment, it will pause traffic to all those entities and rehome them to a new location on the network and then unpause traffic for them again. So it handles a lot of those sort of uh, gnarly networking problems for you. Now, my goal here was just to give you enough of an overview of the different parts of Aka.net and how they work. So you can go research this on your own if you're going down the road of building a real-time application. The last thing I'm going to show you is how to handle a couple of other practical questions, namely around deployment, hosting, and how do we expose Aka.net to end users. So we'll wrap up with that today. This is an example of what I would wager about 50% of Windows Azure Aka.NET deployments look like. Um, Kubernetes goes very nicely with Aka.NET, and I'll get into the reasons why in a second. But typically what you developers will do is all of Aka.NET's communication between the different actor systems all happens privately inside a subnet that is not accessible to end users. Instead, what those developers will typically do is they'll expose a HTTP API or maybe a gRPC endpoint or maybe they'll use WebSockets. You could also use things like Azure Service Bus potentially as a communication endpoint or something like Kafka if you wanted to. And they'll typically use some sort of cloud-based storage system for Akadot persistence. Um, you obviously can use SQL Server if you want to, but Azure, Azure Table Storage works just as well and is a fraction of the cost. So you might as well use something that's cloud native and relatively cheap. So this is sort of generally speaking from an infrastructure standpoint how all of this works. Now the one thing you don't want to do, and this is usually where Unity 3D developers who want to use Aka.net get into trouble, is you don't want to use Aka.net remote directly as your endpoint between uh, end users and Aka.net. And the reason why is that because Aka.net is a peer-to-peer -peer technology fundamentally, it means that every node is both the client and a server. In order to secure a server, what do you need to have on it? The private key for your, for your, for your uh, encryption. So you don't really have a feasible means of, let's say, sharing that with untrusted parties. So you shouldn't go there. Aqueduct Remote's very powerful. And just like exposing a database connection or anything else, you don't want to share that with the outside world. Instead, you typically want to expose perhaps a gRPC endpoint. This is what I'm using in one of my new IoT applications I'm working on, is I'm going to expose gRPC. I'm expecting to have uh, in the order of about a quarter of a million persistent clients connected to my system all the time using this. So we're going to use gRPC for that. Um, but I've also very frequently used HTTP APIs, a little web API uh, that can go ahead and process events or do ingestion from clients. And that's typically what I use when I need a request response model with a client. gRPC is a little bit um, heavier than I need for doing that type of workload. Lastly, I'm a very big fan of using Aka.net with WebSockets. These two technologies go together like peanut butter and chocolate. So if you're doing, let's say, a real-time web UI, so for instance, we have a lot of customers that build things like monitoring dashboards for checking on the health of servers and hardware, or monitoring, let's say, the state of financial transactions, so having, let's say, like a, uh, a trading dashboard. Uh, or if you're doing something like building a real-time uh, chat room or collaboration software, WebSockets are the way to go. Um, and we have, a, uh, we have a really fun demo um, called drawtogether.net in the Petabridge GitHub organization, which is like multiplayer paint.net built in Blazor. That's pretty fun. That's all Aka.net based. Now, the last big question is how do we deal with our infrastructure for hosting Aka.net and what do we need to be concerned about when we deploy? 
the biggest issue with the stateful application during deployments is that you have to move your state when you're deploying a new instance of your service. You have all the state that's being used in real time to, keep, to process those low latency requests. I have to find a way to transition it off of the nodes that are leaving and onto the ones that are coming, right? So that means the way we do deployments is gonna be a little different than how you might deploy a web application that has no state, for instance. Akadot cluster sharding will manage 99.9% .9 of this for you if you allow it. This is the key point, is I'm gonna tell you how to allow it, next. The thing you don't wanna do is an environment swap, which is a very common way of deploying web applications. In the context of Akka.net, what an environment swap looks like is you have a cluster that's in production right now, and you're gonna to try to replace that entire cluster all at once. Remember that problem I mentioned earlier about having two different copies of the customer actor that have different versions of the state? This is how you have that problem, so don't do it. Instead, <laughs> we wanna go ahead and do either a one-by-one -one replacement or you wanna go ahead and do an add and remove deployment where you add nodes to the cluster and then remove the old nodes. That gives us time to go ahead and gracefully transition data off the nodes that are leaving onto the ones that are joining. Aka.net can detect which nodes are newer and which ones are older based on the assembly version number that you're deploying. And when we see a higher assembly version number join, we know that's part of the deployment and we will start rehoming shards on, uh, sh uh, sharded actors onto those nodes first. So Akadot, like I said, cluster sharding will take care of most of this for you if you allow it. But if you blow it up with an environment swap, all bets are off. So in terms of what's the easy mode way of doing this, deploying with Kubernetes and using a stateful set does all of the right things automatically out of the box without you really having to think about it. Um, it does one by one deployment. It uses stable node identities, which is useful for um, a couple of different things inside Akka.net that I'm not gonna get into. And this is typically how I run most of my workloads. However, um, you could also accomplish this with Azure Container Apps, which is relatively new. And you do this by having uh, two revisions at once, your old revision that you're gonna replace and your new revision you're deploying. And what you do is once both revisions are in the same cluster, you go ahead and just shut, begin shutting down the old one. And that'll gradually drain those nodes and turn them off, so it'll happen. Uh, you can also use, if you're an Amazon customer, you can use Elastic Container Services to do this quite easily as well. And you would just use the rolling update strategy for that. So these are sort of some of the easiest out of the box ways of being able to guarantee smooth deployments for Akka.net. So that's it for my talk today. I really appreciate all of you being so attentive. I know it was a lot of concepts. I'll be up here to go ahead and answer questions and there's some uh, free Akka.net stickers on the back. So, you know, as long as you go ahead and put that green card in the bin, wink, wink, um, you can go ahead and walk out with one. Uh, thank you very much.